going to start. We're, we're going through um, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Um, and uh, this, uh, this passage is, is Paul answering a couple, a couple different questions that uh, he had from the Corinthians. And uh, so we're going to be kind of looking at those questions and looking at how Paul answers them, and, and then we're going to go, go through the text like that. And so um, the questions uh, kind of follow like this. And the first one is, is in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 7, verses 1 and 2, and then also in verses 6 through 9. Um, and that question is something to the effect of, is it better to be single or to be married? And Paul answers that question in those passages. And then the second one is, is verses 3 through 5, and, and Paul answers a question, and, and we'll talk a little bit about it more, but it's kind of a, a funny question, but he, he's answering the question, essentially, should we be celibate even within marriage? Um, and then the third question that Paul answers is, um, should Christians separate from their spouse if they are unbelievers? And that's verses 10 through 16. And so kind of a, a, a wide gamut of he, here of, of questions and topics that we're going to look at. Um, but overall, we're going to be talking about what Paul's talking about, and it's pretty much uh, marriage, singleness, and sex. So um, if you guys have just been to a couple Catalysts recently, I promise we don't talk about sex every, every week. Um, it, but we're going through the book of 1 Corinthians, and we, we preach the Bible, and we're going through the whole book, and so we're not leaving any parts out. Um, wanted to make a quick announcement. My family, uh, almost my whole family came down here. My dad, uh, David, which is my sister Tabitha's boyfriend, so then my sister Tabitha, and then my mom uh, came down to hear me preach tonight. So say hi to them. You can make them feel awkward later if you want. Um, but you guys get to hear me talk about sex, so good. Yay. <laughs> All right, so we'll jump in here, and I want to start with uh, verse 1 in chapter 7. And, and it is on the U version. For those of you who have the U version app, um, it, it is on there. So go, go to that with the rough outline and then the passages there as well. Um, but in verse 1, it says, um, Now concerning the matters about which you wrote. Um, so I want to start with this because it is clear that Paul is starting a new section in, uh, in, in this letter. And so he's, he's addressing a, a letter and some topics that the Corinthians had written to him. And so we, we obviously, we don't have this letter, we don't have this list, we don't know exactly what it looked like, but it's clear in the next couple chapters that, that Paul is answering specific questions um, that related to specific problems and issues that were, were going on in the Corinthian church. And so, um, again, we don't have the questions, but it, it, by looking at the answers, it's kind of like a one-sided conversation. You can kind of be a detective and, and figure out what those questions are. And so that's kind of my structure with the three questions. And the first question it, that Paul is answering is essentially something to the effect of, is it better to be single or is it better to be married? And so in verse 1, we see this. Uh, he says, Now concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. Now, some of your guys' translations, especially I think if you have NIV, it'll say it is good for a man not to marry. Um, the, 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 the word in Greek um, has uh, connotations of, of sex, uh, but really what Paul is talking about here is, is, the, is it good for a man to marry or not to marry? Um, and we, we know that because Paul talks about um, married couples having sex in verses 3 through 5. And so we know he's not answering a question to the effect of, you know, should, mar should married couples have sex here? And so, uh, so the, uh, that's what the, the, the word says, but the intent is, it, is, is it, it is good for a man not to marry, is what he is saying. And uh, so, so Paul moves on in verse 2, and he says, uh, It is good for a man to not have sexual relations with a woman, but because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife, and each woman her own husband. Now, um, before you guys get on up out of here on the account that the Bible says you shouldn't have sex even if you're married, hold on a minute. Um, because we, we have to analyze Paul's words here very carefully to figure out exactly what he's saying. Um, and, and it's a little bit confusing because it, it, the way it is said, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman, is, is pretty plain there. Um, but first I want to say that Paul is not addressing the topic of, of sexual immorality um, because that's what Nicholas talked about last week in chapter 6, and, and he's clearly starting a new section. He's starting a new section about uh, questions that the Corinthians had. And so he's not, he's not talking about sexual immorality. Um, and he, he just got done with that. And then second, Paul can't be addressing those who are married in light of verses 3 through 5, which we'll look at later. And so what are we left with here? Is he saying that it's better not to marry? It's better not to have sex? Is that, is that kind of what he's saying? Is that what we're left with? Or is it possible that what Paul means here when he says it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman, uh, that it's similar to a statement that I could make saying uh, Nicholas is a really good campus minister, right? If I say that Nicholas is a really good campus minister, where is Nicholas? 
Oh man, bad campus minister, not even here. Oh no, he's there. Uh, if I say that Nicholas is a really good campus minister, I'm neither saying either good or bad about Mariah and Shandy, right? But if I say that he's a good campus minister, that also leaves a lot of room for me to still say that Mariah and Shandy are also good campus ministers in different ways, right? And so good here in the sense in this sense, should be taken to mean exactly what it says. It is good. So when Paul talks about uh, this issue of should, is it better to be married or to be single, um, he's saying it is good for a man to not get married. It is good for a woman to not get married. And so he's saying it just as plain as that. And so it's meant to be taken as, yes, it is good if someone decides not to be married and therefore be celibate. And so it is good, it is acceptable, it is morally pleasing to God. And that's, that's what Paul is saying here. And so Paul then moves on to make a concession to this statement, though. So he says, essentially, um, it is okay, it is good, it is morally acceptable to be, um, to be single. But he moves on, he makes a concession about the statement in verse 2, and he says, But because of the temptation of sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. Now, Paul says uh, something very similar here in verses um, 6 through 9, and so I want to read those as well. It says, Now, as a concession, not a command, I say this. I wish that all of you were as I myself am, single. Uh, but if they, uh, oh man, I lost my spot. I wish that all of you were as I am, uh, but each has his own gift from God and one of one kind and one of another. To the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. And so Paul further addresses this question here of, is it better to be single or better to be married in this spot as well? And so Paul clearly says that he identifies both singleness and marriage, both as gifts from God. Um, he says that, I, I, but then he also says, I wish that all were as myself I am. Um, and so Paul was single. And so he's saying, hey, it's, it's, good, it's good to be single. It's a noble calling. It is honorable to God. It is good. It is acceptable. Um, but then we're kind of left with, with kind of a puzzling question here, because in verse 2, you know, he says, um, but because of the temptation of sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. And then in verse 9, he says something similar. He says, but if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry, for it's better to marry than to burn with passion. And so this kind of brings up the topic, well, is, is, or the question is, is marriage only for those who can't control their sexual desires, right? And this kind of almost sounds like what Paul is saying here, is it? Is, it, is marriage only an outlet for, um, for uh, uh, sexual uh, pleasure or something like that? Um, and I, I would say no, because what, what Paul is saying here is he's addressing if it's okay to be single, if God values uh, it to be single and that decision, if, and if it's acceptable to God. But he's saying if you have a strong desire to be married, if you have a de strong desire um, for sex, then, then singleness is not for you. Then, then probably that's not the gift that God has given you. And so uh, it's not everyone, though, right? But as a single person, I think he's saying it, it's okay to burn with passion. Um, it's okay to want to be married. It's okay to have a desire for sex. Um, but if that is you and you fall into that category, then God probably isn't giving you the gift of singleness. And, and, and he probably hasn't called you to be single, and so these things are natural as a single person to have a desire to marry, a desire for sex. Um, but that's not everyone, though, and, and that's perfectly fine as well. As Paul says, it is okay, it is good, it is acceptable to be single and therefore celibate and devoted to God in that way as well. And so uh, Paul, Paul kind of uh, makes the point here that it's not an either or, it's a both are acceptable. Um, and now at this point, I feel like I need to uh, apologize a little bit. Um, because I, I've heard many a preacher and many people say throughout the years that, um, that Paul has a very low view of marriage or, or a very low view uh, of sex or something like that. Um, and I have to be honest, you know, when you read through this passage, just kind of point blank, it's kind of a little bit what it sounds like. And, uh, and I found myself repeating those statements um, without ever actually going back and really studying what Paul is saying here. Um, and so the reason I'm apologizing is because I don't think that Paul does have, I don't think that he does have a low view of sex or of marriage um, or of singleness either. Um, and so what Paul is saying here in verses 1 and 2, it's good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman, but because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. It is good for a Christian to be single. It is pleasing to God. But it is not good for a Christian to strive for singleness, but then burn with passion and burn with a desire for marriage and for sex. And so that's what Paul is saying here. And so if you, if you find yourself uh, as a single person, 
uh, having a strong desire for marriage or a strong desire for sex, then probably God is not giving you the gift of singleness, and that's okay. But if you're a single person and you do not have a strong desire for these things, or maybe you even have a strong desire to be single and be devoted to God in that way, then that's also okay too. And so don't let anybody tell you otherwise. In fact, if somebody tries to, you can be like, hey, well, Paul was single and he said it was good. It was, he wishes that everybody were like that. Um, and so both things are good, acceptable, and pleasing to God. And so here's, here's kind of the overall uh, point of this, I think, is that we can't strive for what we have not been given. Um, Paul refers to both singleness and marriage as a gift, right? He says in, ver- in verse 7, I wish that all were as myself am, but each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. And so if God has given you one gift to, to, to have the desire to be married, um, then don't strive for singleness, and vice versa. The opposite is, is also true. And uh, and so here's the application. Um, you guys, many of you know, Jesus said, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, right? That's a command for all Christians of all time. And so whether you are a single person or whether you are an individual who happens to also be married, this call to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness is, is a call on every one of our lives. And so obviously, no doubt, this looks vastly different um, for an individual who is married to seek first Christ's kingdom and his righteousness. And it also looks very different probably a lot of times for somebody who is not married and single and maybe living an entire life of singleness and celibacy to God. But either way, as individuals, we all have the same call to follow Christ, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And so, uh, so that's really the application for this. It's not a, which one is better. Um, it's that both are acceptable to God if we are glorifying him either in our singleness or in our marriages. The second question that Paul addresses here is in verses three through five. Um, and, and essentially, I, I think what he's answering is, should we be celibate in marriage? And the reason I say that is because it's, it, it sounds a little bit strange. It's, I mean, that's kind of crazy, right? If you think about it, um, why would you ask that question? Um, but I, th- I think what Paul is addressing here is, is a question to the type of, well, hey, is, if the Corinthians are saying, hey, Paul, is it better for us to be single and celibate and devoted to God in that way? And then I think that they may have even went as far as to say, and if so, could, is it possible for um, people who are already married to also attain this same level of righteousness and that sort of thing? And so Paul is addressing um, what it looks like to be married in relation to sex. And so in verses three through, through five, we'll read those really quickly here. It says, the husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, and the wife, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again so that Satan might not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. And so Paul answers this question of should we be celibate even within marriage here in these verses? Um, and to put it bluntly, no, um, that's not, no, the answer is no. That's not what he's saying. Um, so in verse three, he says, the husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband. Um, and so what's interesting is the, the Greek word for give here is actually the same word and phrasing that Jesus used when he said, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar's, Right. And so it's kind of referring to a paying a debt or giving something that is owed. And so Paul uses this metaphor to stress the fact that um, for a married couple, um, they owe each other sex, essentially, is, is what it's saying. But what needs to be emphasized here is not that one partner would say to the other, hey, you need to have sex with me because the Bible says so. That's not what the Bible is teaching here. That's not how that works. Um, the emphasis here is that on each partner giving, not receiving or taking for their own benefit. It's each person giving out of love to the other partner. And, and Paul doesn't stress one as higher than the other. The, the husband does not deserve it more or need it more, and the wife does not deserve it more or need it more. Uh, they both are equal in, in, in what it says. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights, and likewise the wife to her husband. And so um, really, uh, John, John Piper, he puts it this way, and I'll, I'll, I'll quote his book a little bit later. It's, uh, it's a great book if you're looking uh, for, for a book on marriage, um, sex, and even singleness. He has a great chapter in there on singleness. Um, but it's called This Momentary Marriage, if any of you want to read it. Um, but he puts it this way in reference to this uh, verse. He says, um, the goal here in reference to this verse is to outdo one another in giving what the other wants. 
And so that, that's pretty, that's pretty uh, self-explanatory. I think, I think when it comes to sex, sometimes even as married couples, we overcomplicate things, right? And we have all of these preconceived notions that we, that we come into marriage with. Um, but really, that, that's pretty simple. The goal is to outdo one another in giving what the other wants. And uh, this concept really is no different than any other uh, thing that you do in married life. Um, Hannah and I both absolutely hate doing the dishes. Um, we just hate it. And so if one of us is doing the dishes, it's not because like we assigned one or the other to do it. It is an act of service. It's an act of love and sacrifice. I did the dishes last, so <laughs> get that out there. But really, this, this idea when it comes to sex of, of, of giving to one another and, and pleasing your partner over yourself, it's no different than anything else in marriage or any other action that we have um, within marriage. So Paul moves on into verse 4, and he kind of continues this, this image. He says, For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. And so Paul is communicating the concept here that, that when you are married, your body is no longer just your own. So this is kind of the practical implications of, the, uh, of when the Bible says that two will become one flesh. Um, and so, so even re outside of sex and within sex, your, your body is not just your own. You have an obligation to your partner, whomever you've married um, at that time. And then in, in verse 5, Paul says, Do not deprive one another except perhaps by agreement for a limited time that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. So Paul then uh, moves on to show that, that sexual intimacy in marriage uh, should actually be the norm. And so uh, again, the answer to should we be celibate within marriage, no. Um, because he, he says uh, it should be the norm because he says do not deprive each other except perhaps by agreement for a limited time. So that's an, implying that, that sexual intimacy is a normal, regular part of the marriage relationship. And so he says do not deprive each other except perhaps by agreement for a limited time that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Um, I, I think Paul brings up this, this idea of uh, deprivation of sex to, to maybe focus more on prayer, um, kind of like you would do for fasting. You might stop eating to be more focused on prayer and more focused on God for a little while. Um, and the reason I think he brings this up is because I think the question that they are asking is, should married couples be celibate to be more holy or to be um, more righteous with God or to be more focused on God? And essentially Paul is saying, no, no that's not how the marriage relationship works. But if you were going to stop having sex for a little while, um, do it by mutual agreement for a limited time to be focused on God. And then he makes another concession saying, but come back together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. And so again, Paul isn't saying here that sex is only for those who have no self-control. Um, it's just plain common sense. Um, and it's not just the wife or just the husband, but the fact is, um, as a married couple, um, throughout your life, uh, sexual temptations are going to be, to be part of life. And they may be, look different or take different forms or, or come at different times within marriage, but um, sexual temptation does not just go away once you're married. Um, there are things in this world, um, sex is, has been perverted by this world uh, to so much of a degree that it, it kind of surrounds us, right? And so Paul is saying, don't, don't be stupid and, and deprive each other of sex. Instead, he says, uh, come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Now, in Christian circles, um, we don't talk about sex very often, right? And that's pretty much true. Um, but when we do talk about sex, we usually talk about sex in the negative, right? The things that we shouldn't do, right? The things that are sexual immorality. Um, and Nicholas preached a great sermon last week about sexual immorality from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And, uh, and so normally we focus on those things. And those passages are extremely applicable um, in the culture that we have today. Um, just like Corinth, um, our culture is, is completely saturated with uh, sexuality and sex and a perversion of what God intended sex to be. And so those passages are, are great, but um, a lot of times we don't, all, we don't talk about, if we do talk about sex, we don't talk about sex in the positive. We don't talk about it in its proper place and what it is. And I think it's important to do this when uh, we're preaching through passages and, and that talk about sex within marriage, um, because I think if we don't, sometimes we end up with a lot of married couples that go into marriage, and, and if we don't, as the church, talk about what the Bible says about sex, um, we have a bunch of married couples that, that go into marriage, and their only ideas of what sex is, is from the world, and which many times is very perverse, and not what God has intended it to be. 
And so I want to take just a couple minutes and I want to talk about um, two biblical truths about sex within marriage. Um, just two. There's a lot of uh, biblical truths about sex in marriage. We could preach an entire sermon series on it. I don't know that I would specifically want to do that. Um, but there are a lot of biblical truths about sex. Um, but here's just two that I think we find very clear in these three verses here. Um, and for reference, I'm, I'm borrowing pretty heavily from John Piper's book, uh, This Momentary uh, Marriage, for these two points. Um, but the first one is, within marriage, sex is not dirty, sex is good. Um, Paul clearly talks about married couples having sex here. Um, in 1 Timothy 4, verses 4 through 5, it says, For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. So Paul is saying to Timothy, everything God created is good. And we know that when God created the world, he created everything perfect and good, right? And so uh, have, you, have any of you guys read The Screwtape Letters? It's by C.S. Lewis. Give a hand raise. Great book, great book. So for those of you that haven't, um, it's, it's C.S. Lewis is writing from the perspective of like an elder demon. And, and this elder demon is writing letters to, um, to a younger demon, like an apprentice demon, who is tempting and trying to distract uh, you know, a person. And so it's kind of this one-sided conversation where you fill in the other half of the story, kind of like here, I guess, where we're filling in the questions that the Corinthians are asking. Um, but there's one uh, point of the book that I'll never forget. And the, the elder demon is writing to the younger one, and he, and he says this. He says something to the effect of, um, you know, we, as the demons, are, are at an extreme disadvantage. He says, everything that was created was created to be good, and it was created perfect. And so he said, for us to get people to sin, we have to take something that was good and twist it to be something that's bad. And, you know, sex is the perfect example of that concept, God created everything to be good, including sex. But Satan and the world and sin's effect on the world has twisted sex, taken it out of its context within marriage that God created it to be, and perverted something that God created to be good. And so as a married couple and, and people go, who will, a lot of you go into marriage, we have to understand that sex within marriage is good. It's not bad. We talk about sex as being bad a, a, a lot or in the negative a lot in the church, but sex within marriage is good. It is healthy, it is normal, and it is, it is helpful to the marriage relationship, as Paul kind of talks about here. And so actually, we're, we're kind of missing out on what God created um, uh, with that. And so Paul even says, you know, to answer this question again, uh, should we be celibate within marriage? Paul essentially just says, no, married couples have sex. And he says, maybe if you want to deprive each other for a limited time, do it, but then come back together again. And in the sex-obsessed culture that we live in, I think it's very important for us as Christians to understand what the biblical truths about sex are. And so this is one of them. Within marriage, sex is good. It is perfect. It is God-ordained. The second uh, biblical truth is within marriage, sex is a way to defeat Satan's attacks. Paul says in the end of verse 5, he says, but then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you. So sex within marriage, in its proper context, is a means of defeating Satan's attacks. That's pretty cool. And we got to be honest here, that's pretty cool. Um, sex is a means of defeating Satan's attacks. Uh, we're told so many lies about sex from the culture that we live in, from every TV show, um, people sleeping around, having sex before marriage, uh, people cheating on each other within marriage, pornography, homosexuality, all of these perversions of what God created to be good. And if we only hear what the world has to say, we're, we're not going to truly understand what God created sex to be. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16 says, In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Now, I have a blowgun, and I've thought about it before, but there is no way I can get the darts to be flaming. Um, <laughs> but that would be a fierce weapon, and that's, that's, that's how Paul describes Satan's attacks. Flaming darts. I don't want to get hit with one of those. Um, but Paul says in Ephesians here that we guard against Satan's attacks with faith, Right? And then in 1 Corinthians here, Paul says that married couples guard against Satan's attacks um, um, with sex. And so John Piper poses the question in his book. He says, well, which one is it? Is it faith or is it sex for married couples, right? And he says, quote, the answer for married people is that faith makes use of sex as a means of grace. For the people that God leads into marriage, sexual relations are a God-ordained means of overcoming temptation to sin. And so sex within marriage is not bad. It was created by God to be good, perfect, perfect part of his plan, 
And in a culture that is so saturated by lies about sex and what it is and where it should be and where it should not be, we need to be able to understand that God created it to be good within marriage. So now we'll move on to our, our, our third and kind of final section here. And some of you are like, oh man, he's done talking about sex, I'm checking out. And then the other part of you are like, wow, he's finally done. Um, sorry, I can't please everybody here. So the last question that Paul has is essentially to the effect of, should Christians separate from their spouse if they are unbelievers? Um, now, this was probably a pretty fairly um, common occurrence, especially in the early church when the church was growing rapidly. Um, many people were coming uh, to be believers in Christ, and, and inevitably there were many people um, that were married, and one spouse became a Christian and one spouse didn't. And so this was a question that the Corinthians had clearly written to Paul about, and he starts to answer it in verses 10 through 16. So in verses 10 through 11, he starts out, he says, "'To the married I give this charge, not I but the Lord. The wife should not separate from her husband, but if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and the husband should not divorce his wife.'" So Paul begins with just the basic statement about what the Bible and Jesus have taught marriage to be, um, permanent. As Nicholas talked about um, last week, um, marriage was given to us so that we could, uh, so that we could see a kind of a live drama of Christ's relationship with the church. And so uh, th that, that's what marriage is supposed to be. It's supposed to be permanent because I can tell you this, Jesus is not going to abandon his church. And so that's what marriage is supposed to um, relate. And then in verse 12, he, he, he gets into the, uh, the actual topic. And so he says, to the rest, I say, I not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. Now, um, before I go any further, in, in verse 10 and verse 12, Paul makes kind of a, a funny statement that I think has confused a lot of people. So I want to kind of clear the air here. In, in verse 10, he says, not I, but the Lord, right? And then in verse 12, he says, I, not the Lord. And so he's kind of saying like, well, this thing was said by the Lord, and then this thing is said by me. And so a lot of people have kind of taken this and, and said, well, is the first part like God's words, and then the second part is just like Paul's, um, you know, human words or something? Um, and that's really not what it is, because when, when he refers to the Lord, he's referring to Jesus. And so he's saying, in the first part, he's saying, not I, but the Lord say this to married people. Um, he, he's, he's essentially reiterating Jesus's words um, that we find in the book of Matthew on marriage. And so he's, he's just saying, this is directly from Jesus, what he said. And then in verse 12, he, he's saying, I, not the Lord, um, say this, um, because he, he's essentially saying, this is a topic that Jesus never dealt with. This is a topic that Jesus never taught on when he was here on earth. And so this doesn't mean that Paul's words aren't inspired by God here, because we believe that the Holy Spirit inspired these men, like Paul, to write the Bible down, and they are God's words. And so, um, so this is still God's inspired words. What Paul is saying is that this is a new concept. This is a new teaching about marriage. And so he says in verse 12, um, essentially, if you have a, a, a spouse that is an unbeliever, um, stay with them, right? And so... Uh, so Paul says that, that, that uh, marriage should still be uh, permanent, if at all possible. Um, if the unbelieving partner is willing to tolerate um, the new beliefs and practices, that the, that the believing partner should not um, seek a divorce. And so Paul um, says it pretty clearly there. Um, and then in verse 13, he says, if any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever, and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. So same for uh, both man and, uh, men and women. Um, if, if the unbelieving partner uh, consents to live with them in their, their new uh, way of life, then that's fine. Continue that. Um, then he moves on into verse 14, and this is kind of another confusing verse. He says, For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. Now, a lot of people have taken this verse to say, well, or, or to speculate as to whether um, if you are a believer and then your spouse is not a believer, that somehow, uh, you know, the believing spouse, you know, provides salvation to the unbelieving spouse or something like that. Um, but Paul is clearly not saying that. And, and I want to first point out that uh, in, in verse 16 that it shows he's not saying that, at least. Um, in verse 16, it says, for how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? How do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? And so we're still left with this, uh, this idea of the husband making holy the unbelieving wife or vice versa. Um, and so he's not saying it, it, that would be completely inconsistent with what he says in verse 16. And it would also be in, inconsistent with the rest of scripture because we know that God um, does view people collectively like he views um, us collectively as the church in many ways. 
Um, but he also view, but in, in terms of salvation, he views each person individually. Um, and your salvation is between you and God and no one else, nothing else. Um, and, and that's how God deals with people. And so that's not what he's saying here. And so uh, what some of the commentators say, and I think that this is probably pretty much what he's saying in verse 14, is that um, the believing spouse, uh, by staying with their unbelieving spouse, um, is, is, is providing a light of the gospel and a light of grace to the unbelieving spouse. And so that there is opportunity there for a change of heart and, and growth there. And then the same thing with the children, right? He says, otherwise your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. And so I think he's, when he says unclean and holy, I think he's talking about kind of the state of the household. Um, and so essentially he's saying here, you know, uh, husband, if, if, you're, if your wife is an unbeliever, don't leave her because now your children don't have the ability to grow up in a home where they see the gospel evident and where they see grace evident in the lives of at least one of their parents. Paul moves on to verse 15. He says, but if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. Um, so essentially, uh, Paul says, if the unbelieving partner does uh, uh, want to leave, um, let them go. He says, God has called you to peace. And now what this does not mean is that if you're married and, and your, your marriage isn't very peaceful, it's not very peaceful in, in your home, uh, that you should hope that your spouse becomes an unbeliever and then leaves you so that you're free from them. No, that's not what the Bible is teaching here. Um, but I think what Paul is saying is he's just being real in the fact that um, if, if there's one spouse that's a believer and there's one that's not, and the one who's not a believer wants to leave, that it's, it's not going to attain anything. They've already made up their minds. It's not going to be peaceful. It's not going to be productive um, for, for the believing spouse to continue to try to hold on to that after it's already done. And then in verse 16, Paul says, For how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? Um, this is Paul's uh, version of saying uh, missionary dating does not work, is not a thing. You should not do it. Um, now, probably at least one or two of you will come up and be like, hey, I have a friend, though, who... That's okay. That's the 1%. Uh, <laughs> we should not be using marriage as a means of evangelism. Um, if that was the case, I think the Bible would be talking about marrying people who are unbelievers all the time, but it does not. Um, and so in conclusion of this passage, I, 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 think, I think the driving force of this passage is... Um, should we be single or, or should we be married? And, and which is better? Um, and I think that we need to realize a couple things um, as Christians. As Paul talks about these, this in, in varying circumstances, right? He talks about um, people who are widows or who are still unmarried or people who are married. And, and he's dealing with all these different types of situations within marriage and singleness. And uh, I think we need to realize that, that as a Christian community, both marriage and single, singleness truly are gifts from God. I know that's kind of a cliche phrase, you know, we hear like, oh, the gift of singleness, the gift of marriage, right? We have these kind of cliche Christian things that get annoying sometimes, but it, it comes from the Bible. You know, Paul, Paul says, I wish that all were as myself am, but each has one, has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of the other. And so we need to realize that marriage is no higher morally, or it's not some uh, higher level of righteousness that you can attain with God. And singleness is not a lower level of righteousness or a higher one either. Um, both can be good and morally acceptable to God. And so if I can suggest two things on this topic, um, marriage and singleness, or marriage versus singleness. Um, first, stop comparing the two. Um, both have unique abilities to serve God, and both come with their unique challenges in serving God. But if our overall goal is to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, we will do that regardless of whether we're single or whether we're married or whether we want to be married or whether we don't want to be married. Um, and second, I want to say, uh, stop comparing your situation with those that are around you. Um, if God has placed a desire on your heart to be married, then he's probably going to bring somebody to you. Um, and I want to say two things on that. First, uh, statistically, a lot of people get married, I don't know, probably like 90%. So statistically, you've got a pretty good chance if you want to be married. At some point, you will be married. Um, but secondly, maybe a little bit more biblically, um, the Bible says what God has brought together, let no man separate in terms of marriage. And so uh, this tells us that God ordains marriage. And so if God has placed a desire on your heart to be married, he will bring a spouse to you. Um, it'll be in his timing. Um, it'll be in his way, maybe not yours, maybe not right when you want it, right? Um, but God will bring somebody to you. And then you will have the opportunity to live out the drama between Christ and the church, showing God's love to the world in that special and unique way that marriage provides. Um, if you are single, 
And if you do not feel God's call on your heart uh, to be married, if you do not feel a strong desire for marriage or for sex, um, then don't let other people push you to, to have that desire or to try to get that desire. Um, because maybe you're like Paul, and maybe the gift that God has given you is not to live a life in marriage, but to live a life in single devotion to God. And so don't let anybody tell you otherwise or convince you that it, you're somehow a second-rate Christian or something like that. Um, I feel like we have a lot of these kind of um, stereotypes within Christian culture. That's, that's not what Paul is saying here. And so if you have a desire to be single, um, be single and be devoted to God in that way. And look for unique and special ways that you can serve God in your singleness that you wouldn't be able to, to serve God in if you were committed and devoted to a spouse and, um, and family. And so I think the overall um, principle here for marriage and singleness is do not strive for the, a gift that you have not been given. Um, as flat as that, if, if you're single and you don't feel a call to get married, don't let anybody pressure you into it. If you feel a desire to get married um, and a desire for sex, then don't think that you need to be single to attain some higher level of righteousness or closeness to God. Instead, glorify God in the ways that he has specifically given you the ability to do so, whether that be in marriage, in singleness for a time, or in singleness for your entire life. Glorify God. Let us seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we come to you now and we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word speaks so much truth into our lives. God, I thank you for the encouraging words of Paul to both those who are married and, both, and those who are single. God, I thank you for your sacrifice in Jesus Christ. I thank you that, that you came and you died on the cross for our sins and you resurrected on the third day so that we could live with you, so that we could join with you in a resurrection as well. Thank you, Lord, and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.